Hello everybody, thanks for joining me. I'm Dr. Larry Malerba, and welcome to the first episode of Rethinking Science, the purpose of which is to challenge false narratives regarding science, medicine, health, and healing. Freedom of thought and the right to medical self-determination are under attack, and Rethinking Science provides a forum for dissent in this time of unprecedented censorship. Now, I think it's important right from the start to give you a sense of who I am and where I'm coming from. So let me begin by making it absolutely clear that I am not anti-science. Really? Yes. I am a critic of science, sometimes strongly so, but that does not make me anti-science. I love science. After all, I have a total of nine years of academic training in science. I got my undergrad degree in natural sciences from Michigan State University, my medical training from the University of Osteopathic Medicine, and another year of residency training in a New York hospital. I also worked in a psychiatric emergency room for two years. So it is possible to both walk and chew gum at the same time. There is no contradiction whatsoever in being both a lover of science and a critic of science. Those who would like to pigeonhole me as anti-science, simply because I criticize science, are sorely mistaken. In addition to my science education and my conventional medical training, I have practiced a holistic form of medicine called homeopathy for more than 30 years. My perspective is unique because it comes from having experienced the medical system as both an insider and an outsider. And after all these years, I still see the value of both systems of medicine. It has made me acutely aware of both the strengths and weaknesses of each. I've seen thousands of patients who tried mainstream medicine, but were not happy with the results. I've also seen patients who, during the course of homeopathic care, I recognize as needing a conventional diagnostic workup or conventional medical care. My point is that health care is not an either-or, zero-sum game. All approaches to healing have their value. They have their pluses and their minuses. Such an idea runs contrary to the current cultural atmosphere that seeks to paint everything as if there's a right way and a wrong way. Remember, we can walk and chew gum and do other things too. With that said, my purpose in creating Rethinking Science is to shine a light on the tremendous confusion and dysfunction swirling around modern science and medicine. In these highly polarized times, a lot of people have strong opinions about their support for science or their mistrust of science, and yet many of them don't really know a lot about science, about its strengths, weaknesses, and limitations. Our lack of understanding of these issues is literally tearing society apart. With Rethinking Science, I hope to clarify some of these issues. I'll be talking about science, scientism, skepticism, pseudoscience, orthodox science, corporate science, science and politics, science and religion, authentic science, fake science, old paradigm science, new paradigm science, conventional medicine, holistic medicine, biotech, genetic engineering, germ theory, medical authoritarianism, medical imperialism, scientific propaganda, informed consent, and the freedom to disagree, criticize, and to dissent. Okay, so I guess the best place to start is by defining science, which surprisingly is not as easy as it may sound. If we ask various people on the street for the definition of science, we get all kinds of different and even conflicting answers. Some might say, science is how we know what's true and what's not true. It's how we tell fact from fiction. Some would say that science is fact or truth. Of course, neither of these are the correct definition of science. Others might say that science tells us what's real. And still others would say that science is the best way to understand the world around us. As we shall see, all of these answers are either well off the mark or only partially true. Let's try a textbook definition of science. This is from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Science is, quote, 
knowledge about or study of the natural world based on facts learned through experiments and observation. Okay, that's not too bad. I agree with most of that, although it would depend on what is meant by facts. Another definition from the same source is as follows. Science is the state of knowing, knowledge as distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. Now, that's a real doozy. It may be one of the worst definitions of science that I've ever seen. Amazingly, it comes from one of the world's most reputable dictionaries. With definitions like that, it's not hard to see why so many people would be so badly misled about what science really is. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are lots of really bad definitions out there, and together they contribute to society's confusion about science. At its most fundamental level, most people are so badly informed about science that it's no wonder they can't even agree what it is, let alone make informed decisions about policy and the role that science should play in society. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a more accurate definition of science, the one that stays faithful to the original meaning of the term. Science is a methodology used to gather information and knowledge about the natural world. Period. That's it. If I'm being generous, we can expand the definition slightly to read, Science is a methodology involving observation and experiment used to gather information and knowledge about the natural world. Now, it's true that lots of people would say that the body of knowledge encompassed by biology, for example, is science. By the same logic, that definition would apply to chemistry, geology, physiology, and so on. However, technically speaking, science is the methodology used to develop the body of knowledge that we call biology. Science is not the knowledge itself. Science is the method used to develop that knowledge. Now, I understand that this distinction is almost always overlooked and that many people use the term science to refer to the knowledge circumscribed by a particular scientific discipline. And that's okay with me as long as people understand the difference between scientific methodology itself and the various bodies of knowledge that it uncovers and produces. Science is a method. Chemistry is a discipline that employs scientific method. Again, in common parlance, we may say that chemistry is a science, but that's only true if we're referring to the methods used by chemistry to develop its knowledge base. The knowledge itself is not science. It is the body of knowledge produced by the field of activity that we call chemistry. Now, you may think that I'm just nitpicking here, but I make this definitional distinction for a number of important reasons, and I'll be coming back to this distinction repeatedly in future episodes. One of the most important reasons is that the body of knowledge generated by a particular scientific discipline is always a work in progress. It is never settled and is always subject to revision, pending more information and greater insight. Nevertheless, culture at large seems to have somehow reached the conclusion that the knowledge produced by science is irrefutable settled fact. In other words, that knowledge is certain and cannot be questioned. The problem is that science is not a declaration of factual certainty. It is a reference to a method of inquiry. It's gotten so crazy out there that various parties intentionally utter the word science in order to stifle debate, as if to say that the point they're making cannot be questioned. They know that if they use the word science, others will be intimidated into silence. The minute you see someone using that tactic, you know that their claims are suspect and may have little to do with science. Science is a method of inquiry and discovery, one that welcomes challenges and is open to new ideas. Any scientific discipline that thinks it is acceptable to shut down debate automatically loses its status as science. In doing so, it has more in common with dogma and ideology than science. Furthermore, if one dares to question a scientific finding, one may be quickly labeled as anti-science. 
in the media, in politics, in common usage, and even in scientific institutions. The word science has become virtually interchangeable with the words factual, truthful, and incontrovertible. Not only is that ridiculous, but it's downright unscientific. Science is a method, and the information produced by that method fits a broad spectrum that ranges from the highly speculative to highly certain. Literally none of that information falls under the category cannot be questioned. We tend to associate such attitudes with fundamentalist religion, not science, at least not until recently. In future episodes, I will be discussing how this overly simplistic, childish black and white notion of science has crept into public consciousness, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. For now, let's return to our definition of science. I've established that science is a methodology. It is most definitely not a reference to fact or truth or certainty. Note that it is a methodology designed as a tool to study the natural world. So the next question becomes, what does science mean by the natural world? Well, it means all that is physical, the material universe. That's the three-dimensional space occupied by material objects. To be completely fair, the domain of science includes anything that can be detected or measured by its instruments. So that also includes various forms of energy, such as radio waves, microwaves, or electricity. If this is true, then it would be reasonable to assume that science encompasses the study of literally everything. But of course, that's not true. The problem is that that assumption can only be made if you're a strict materialist, which is to say, if you believe that the material universe is the only thing that exists. A materialist conception of the universe does not include a god, an afterlife, or a psychic or spiritual dimension of any sort. Now, I understand that the world is full of atheists who don't believe in any of those things, and I respect their right to hold those beliefs, but there's still a very large unspoken problem that atheists have on their hands. Their materialist conception of the universe doesn't even account for consciousness itself. I'll be covering this topic in much greater depth in future episodes, so I'll mention it only briefly here. Consciousness, by definition, is not part of the natural world. The domain of science does not include anything that we associate with mind. What do I mean by mind? Well, that would constitute the entire subjective universe of human experience, including thought, emotion, dreams, intuition, and creativity. Consciousness includes all mental phenomena, and some would say, much more. Science, however, cannot see, touch, hear, smell, taste, measure, or detect mental phenomena with its instruments. And yet, you'd practically have to be an insensate robot to claim that mind isn't real, to argue that human consciousness doesn't exist. The greatest irony of all is that science itself could not exist without the efforts of the human mind. In order to supposedly resolve this problem, those of the materialist persuasion employ a rather transparent trick, one that fails to meet the smell test. They argue that all mental phenomena are just secondary phenomena, and that they are produced by the physical brain. This doesn't smell quite the way I expected. In this rather macabre scenario, human experience is reduced to a complex interplay of neurotransmitters and electrical brain impulses. Of course, they have every right to think that, but it still doesn't account for the fact that neither consciousness nor subjective experience can be detected by science. It's really nothing more than a gimmick to claim that the physical brain accounts for the entire immaterial universe of human experience. Again, I'll be returning to this topic in future episodes. Science, therefore, is left with two options. Either it acknowledges the existence of mind, consciousness, and the psychic and spiritual worlds, and then admits that those things lie outside the boundaries of scientific inquiry, or it denies that they exist at all. 
A third possibility would be to admit that they do exist and then attempt to include them or at least account for them in their considerations and calculations in as much as that would be possible. Of course, that would mean that the very definition of science would have to change to evolve, if you will. Science would have to officially acknowledge that there is a whole lot more to existence than that which meets the eye. So as you can see, we have a fundamental problem that lies at the very foundation of science. Most people do not understand what science really is. The term science, therefore, tends to be used, misused, and abused by all sorts of individuals and institutions, including scientists themselves. When we take a clear, open-eyed look at what is really meant by science, then we either have to acknowledge that science frequently and inappropriately oversteps its bounds, and that its imperialistic impulses therefore must be reined in, or else we have to redefine science itself in a more inclusive, open-minded, and enlightened manner. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the inaugural episode of Rethinking Science. Please subscribe and please tune in again to the podcast that challenges conventional views regarding science and medicine and that defends citizens' rights to dissent and to make informed choices for themselves.